1971 was a difficult year in the United States. People were made aware that they weren't always safe in their houses after the Tate LaBianca murders by the Manson family two years prior in the Los Angeles region and four students protesting the Vietnam War were shot down at Kent State. Blacks were rioting in major cities across the nation while the Watergate scandal was being quietly advanced by the administration. Mac Ray Edwards brought in a loaded revolver and claimed he felt sorry when the Los Angeles police first learned of his six-year crime spree. He claimed to have murdered six children since the 1950s, all of whom had vanished in reality. The largest known murder total committed by one person would soon be witnessed in America. Only the Boston Strangler, who claimed 11 victims in 1964, had until that point spectacularly demonstrated what a serial killer was like to the nation. The term itself was not yet in common usage. The case that startled the country was extensively covered in San Francisco newspapers and Tracy Kidder's The Road to Yuba City, which was first published as a series of stories in the Atlantic Monthly, is the classic book on the investigation and the first trial. Kidder rode in box cars as one of the victims, listening to their concerns, experiencing the cold and hunger, working alongside them picking peaches, and attempting to understand how vulnerable they were in order to write a complete narrative with a fair sense of the victims, many of whom were farm workers. He also visited numerous locations to learn more about the key participants, spoke with the relatives of the victims, attended the trial, and considered suspects besides the defendant. He hoped to illustrate the inherent hazards of a rejected lifestyle that could end as quickly as it had for so many men in that one location by highlighting the events of 1971 as more than simply an isolated example. California attracted the attention of the entire globe once more. Other books concerning the case include Ed Cray's Burden of Proof, Bill Tailbitzer's Pro-Prosecution Time, Too Much Blood, and Jury, The People vs. Juan Corona, which is about the first jury. Newspapers in California carried great coverage of the investigation and the first trial. According to David Frazier in Murder Cases of the 20th Century, a Japanese farmer named Goro Keichiro was touring his peach orchard on May 19, 1971 when he noticed a freshly dug hole between two trees that appeared to be the size of a man and was located in Sutter County, California, close to the Feather River and five miles north of Yuba City. He was baffled as to why somebody would have excavated there. A group he hired through Juan Vallejo Corona, who ran a labor contracting company, was working nearby harvesting peaches. Michael Newton claims that Corona provided low-cost labor in the form of migrant workers from Mexico to local ranchers. Keichiro went back to the orchard that evening to investigate the hole and discovered it had been filled. That gave him additional cause for concern, so he alerted the police, who showed up the following morning to take a look. Someone had at the very least entered the land illegally, possibly to bury their rubbish. Nobody anticipated discovering anything of importance. When several deputies dug, they were surprised to find the body of a thin white man instead of what they had expected. They made a quick call to the homicide investigators. Kenneth Whitecker, the victim, was stabbed in the chest, beaten in the head, and had the back of his skull cut repeatedly. Deep cuts could be seen on his hands, suggesting that he struggled to defend himself. He had everything on, and there was reading material in his pocket that indicated he might be gay. The LGBT rights movement had just started in the adjacent city of San Francisco at that time. People with preconceptions against gay men's lifestyle were agitating, and occasionally they retaliated out of rage and terror. However, other than the tire marks next to the lone burial, there were no indications as to who had slain him and buried him here. It was a homicide, to be sure, but there didn't seem to be anything unusual about it, certainly not that day. Kidder assumed that this murder had been committed by two persons. They may have picked up this man, who may have needed money and offered intercourse, killed him to get out of paying. Plaster and prints of the tracks were made by the deputies at the grave site, but they concluded that the occurrence seemed to have been a one-off, presumably the sad outcome of a quarrel that someone was attempting to cover up. The tests required to look for signs of a RP on the body were not even performed by the medical examiner. They gave him over to a mortician after a quick autopsy revealed that several of the head wounds happened after the victim had already passed away. The incident was written off as yet another issue in that area with homeless drifters because it was random and possibly impossible to resolve. The killer appeared angry given the severity of the attack, but that was pretty much all they had to say. That is, until on May 24, four days later, workers using a tractor on a neighboring ranch discovered a second location where the ground looked to have fallen. Ray Duran, the foreman, investigated everything and called the police to come as well. 
They moved forward with increased care in light of what they had recently discovered. Another male corpse was found in this second grave, and it took several days before Charles Fleming, another vagrant, could be positively identified. Detectives searched the surrounding area all day long but came up empty-handed. An entrance into a weedy region near to a peach orchard was then discovered by a deputy. More soil sinking that suspiciously resembled burials was discovered along the riverbed. Once more breaking out the shovels, they discovered several meat invoices from the Yuba City Market that were only four days old and bore Juan V. Corona's signature. The deputies discovered another body when they went farther into the hole, in addition to being bludgeoned in the head and having his skull crushed. This individual had also been sliced with a huge, sharp object, possibly a machete. He had also worked as a poor farm laborer. Roy Whiteacre, the sheriff, thought about the predicament. He had already learned disturbing facts regarding 37-year-old labor contractor Juan Corona. Corona was a main suspect in a Marysville incident that occurred across the Feather River, according to the article. In a nearby cafe, a man named Jose Rea had been beaten almost to death. He was discovered in the restroom bleeding from severe head injuries. Because Natavid and Corona, Corona's half-brother who was known for being gay, ran the cafe, Corona was made a suspect. Furthermore, Juan was believed to have troubles with gay males to the point of fury in addition to being present there that evening. Additionally, he had been identified as having schizophrenia after a stay in a psychiatric hospital in the 1950s. According to Kidder's account of their conversation, the sheriff found the presence of a blue and white pickup truck near the exhumations that matched Juan Corona's vehicle to be even more intriguing. However, there wasn't much time left to take action. That evening's digging had discovered additional graves. As they discovered more bodies in this area, they began to call the area Graveyard Lane. The Sutter County District Attorney, G to have a look, Dave Teja went outside. A first-degree murder case had always appealed to him as a challenge, and now he had one. Sheriff Whiteacre was approached about obtaining an arrest warrant for Corona, but Whiteacre was hesitant. He was looking for more convincing proof than two receipts and some hazy anecdotes about the man's violent temper. In order to allow for more digging and the possibility of discovering something else resembling those signed receipts, the fire crew installed floodlights. It seemed conceivable that a man had left behind other items that could be used to identify him if he had been that careless as to let something slip from his pocket. Off-duty police officers and part-timers arrived to help and to witness this strange and horrifying discovery. They were accustomed to the occasional act of violence in the area, but not this. Others of the men began to cry and some of them became physically unwell by the images and the overpowering smell. The diggers placed bets on how many bodies they would find as each new body was found and photographed. Nobody got close at all. It was surreal, as if they had stumbled upon a graveyard belonging to an individual. Worse, men were consistently discovered with their pants around their ankles, their genitalia exposed, or nude from the waist down, providing further evidence of open molestation. This had a much more repulsive and decent overtone than simply being murder for gain. What the excavators would uncover next was always a mystery. With a shovel's sharp edge, they occasionally unintentionally chopped off a body part, and the more they dug, the stronger the stink of decay became. A couple bodies had been buried for such an extended period of time without embalming or a box that when they were pulled out, they just broke apart. The staff did their best to place each victim into a zippered corpse bag before leaving them for local morticians to collect. According to Frasier, a total of eight corpses were generated in this location so there had been nine confirmed casualties up to that moment. The bodies were arranged close to one another in the mortuary to make identification easier, and to try to construct a timeline based on rates of decomposition. All of the victims looked to be migrant workers, and they were all killed using the same style of beating or stabbing. A few had also been shot, and according to Frasier, there was evidence of anal intercourse. However, this evidence was never presented during the trial. Therefore it may not have actually been evidence but rather rumor-based speculation that was mistakenly reported as fact. Many were aged and battered. While warning the diggers to be cautious, Sheriff Whiteacre continued searching for additional proof. The meat invoices were satisfactory, but something that directly connected Corona to one or more of the victims was required. It would have to originate from whatever people would know about these individuals if it was not present in the graves or on the persons who were being hauled out, and that would be a much harder task to complete. Some of the victims who were soon recognized as Juan Corona could be attributed by the public. It was circumstantial evidence, to be sure, but in the past, before DNA testing and sophisticated crime-fighting tools, a significant amount of circumstantial evidence frequently sufficed to prove a case. The doc claimed that it is possible to put together a mosaic that is convincing enough to overcome the lack of tangible proof. One victim, for instance, was conversing with another job contractor when Juan Corona drove by. 
When Corona stopped to speak with the victim after the victim shouted to the man, pleading for job, the victim left with Corona. Additionally, several victims had either worked for or been spotted with Corona. In several situations, Corona's company was where a person was last seen. So, the sheriff and district attorney felt they had substantial information that justified a warrant for investigating Corona's home, car, and workplace within a day of discovering the graveyard. So equipped, they started their search for him. On May 26, late in the afternoon, they arrested him at his house. The sheriff instructed a crew to begin searching the area, shocking his wife and four daughters in the process. According to Kidder, they discovered a number of potentially important things in Corona's residence, including a hole puncher, the hatchet, a butcher's knife, more recipes for meat, a ledger containing the names of 34 men, a club made of colored wood, an 18 inches blade, a shovel, a bag of ammunition, bundles of clothing, and a van parked outside that appeared to have blood stains inside it. The interior of Corona's Chevrolet Impala appeared to have blood stains. Deputies went inside Corona's office on the Sullivan property, where the second body had been discovered, to take a look around. They discovered a loaded gun and a long knife with the writing Tennessee toothpick on it there. A smaller knife and additional meat receipts were also discovered. This whole thing was gathered for analysis and testing. They looked through the ledgers as they recognized some of the victims and were able to connect some of the men with Juan Corona. Even though these jobs were finished, some deputies kept searching the area to make sure they hadn't missed anything. According to Cartel, infrared imaging from aircraft helped identify potentially dangerous regions. The fact that this murderer picked a remote location for the mass graves did not exclude him from carrying out similar acts elsewhere. It was a sound hunch. In actuality, there were several such secret cemeteries. Further into the woods, near a prune orchard, investigators discovered another patch of ground impressions that had been left behind after the property had been watered and subsequently drained. They screamed for help and began to dig because it appeared that there were also quite a few of them. This time, they discovered roughly twice as many bodies. One tomb included an individual who might be identified and connected to Corona because he had paperwork on him. The blow that had knocked him out was so powerful that his head had almost come off his body. The ID was still present in his wallet, which was being examined for money most likely. As news of this growing drama spread, reporters from various cities arrived to write about the victims and the culprit. It was referred to as his murder book, as if it had been used to keep track of all of his nefarious activities. People who were concerned that a loved one might be one of the victims wrote inquiries or made calls to the sheriff's office as the news about the incident appeared in the newspapers. The staff was overpowered by the response. More than 1,500 of these requests were made. It came out that many people had not heard from a relative in a very long time. In fact, a lot of families got in their cars and headed to the Sullivan property to take a look. In addition, morbid tourists showed their depots for pictures next to the car that Corona had used to transport workers while holding shovel. To prevent contamination, the sheriff roped off the graves. Later, he sealed off the ranch's entrances. Over the Memorial Day weekend, they put forth a lot of effort and dug everywhere to make sure they hadn't overlooked any victims. It was possible that there were others like that since at least one had been interred in a lonely place. Detectives realized they had to keep investigating for the families as well. Those who wanted to know what had happened to someone who had gone missing for no fault of his own, even though the DA had more than enough victims for an investigation and trial. Reporters set up camp as each day went by in order to be present when a new body was discovered. As the number increased from 10 to 16 to 20, bets were lost and the digging went on. On June 4, the final bodies were located. At that point, there had been 25 fatalities, and each one had been a migrant laborer. Some people thought there were still undiscovered victims, but it was hard to travel from ranch to ranch and dig in every spot where the ground appeared to dip. According to one source, all of the victims were interred with their arms raised over their heads on the north side of a tree, as if there were some sort of ritual or superstition involved. According to Kidder, all but three were Anglo-Saxon and none were Mexican. They were either Native Americans or blacks. The oldest victim was 68 and the youngest was 40. Given their nomadic lifestyle, it was difficult to identify them, but in the end, 21 were located, and their family were informed. A few had been underground for up to a month. Four victims were unknown. And there was additional proof. Excavators had discovered bank deposit slips in one burial that bore Juan Corona's name. That strengthened the argument further. Even while the evidence was extremely compelling, the case was far from a lock. Sheriff Whiteacre prematurely held a press conference to declare that they already had the suspect in custody for the crimes, without examining the facts or holding a trial to determine his guilt. He nominated Corona and made the error of accusing him there and then in the media. Whiteacre noted that Corona had been arrested on suspicion of murder, and that efforts were being made to find the scene where the men may have been slain. 
they would use what they had to be ready for trial in the interim. The public lawyer who was first assigned to Corona then hired multiple psychiatrists to do a mental assessment. His history was cobbled together as journalists conducted further research. He worked as a labor contractor, earning around $20,000 a year, and was respected for being a good father to his four kids. Cartel claims that he never skipped church in disguise of sanity. There are only a few complaints that he did not pay enough for the task done. No reports of maltreatment of employees could be found. He was generally well-liked and well-respected by the ranchers who hired him to bring them labor. While the majority of the fatalities were white men, most of Corona's crew members were from Mexico. A year into the case, Kidder finally ran into him. Corona appeared depressed and exhausted in his detention cell, yet modest. Corona had undergone nearly two dozen shock treatments during an era when that treatment was believed to be effective in restoring the mind, and had been pronounced cured and released. Kidder knew about the man's involuntary stint in an institution after a period of delusions about seeing ghosts, and said, I looked for signs of madness. According to a defense psychiatrist, he was conscious of his actions and did not have a mental illness, although it's typically the other way around. A prosecution psychiatrist determined that the defendant was psychotic. He was taking Thorazine when Kidder met him to ease his anxiety while he waited in jail. Although Corona was said to have had an IQ of 130, he did not read much, and his English was only partially fluent. He was learning how to paint as a diversion and was planning to apply for citizenship in the United States. Overall, he gave the impression of being down. Jerry Gregory, a deputy sheriff, told Cartel that some people had witnessed Juan Corona's darker side, which included a nasty rage. A couple people Gregory spoke to said they had also spotted Corona near the graves. A month following Corona's detention, a lawyer by the name of Richard Hawk relocated to Yuba City and assumed control of the case. As a warning that he meant business, he fired the psychiatrists, disregarded their conclusions, and filed a sizable lawsuit against the county officials, alleging illegal evidence handling, a breach of Corona's rights, slander, and creating emotional distress. Additionally, he disobeyed the gag order placed on all parties involved in the case by allowing Kidder to see the evidence. It was not remarkable. The ledger contained the names of six men, but the prosecution's handwriting expert was unable to confirm with certainty that Corona had written those names. Furthermore, even if he had, it would not necessarily follow that he had killed them. There were a few dates next to the names. According to the forensic tests, the blood evidence was actually paint or animal blood, and there was no blood on the machete. It was revealed that Corona had transported an injured worker who had blood in one of his vehicles. It came out that there was no conclusive connection on the one victim who wasn't too decomposed for an assessment of whether the machete matched the wounds. Both the bullet taken from one victim and the tire tracks did not correspond to any of Corona's vehicles. Additionally, no analysis of the receipts had been performed to demonstrate that only Corona had handled them or to establish a date-based connection between the receipts and the appropriate rate of decomposition of the victim whose grave they were discovered, demonstrating that the receipts had fallen into the grave on the day the victim had been dumped there. Corona also had a defense. He had been on crutches when many of the victims had been attacked. Hawk even thought about having Corona testify in his own defense because he thought the man would be a great witness. However, if Corona didn't conduct this transaction, who did? People typically wanted a matter like this to be resolved completely, due to their desire for an end to everything. Jurors have occasionally found success with even ambiguous evidence. Defense counsel are aware of that. Hawk understood that. Likewise, the DA. Since the killings were found, it has taken significantly longer to bring this case to trial. Hawk was successful in securing a change of venue from Sutter County, which was thought to be too agitated by the media to provide a fair trial. Additionally, he developed relationships with the media to present his client and himself in a more favorable light. He even hinted that the true killer had framed his client by placing evidence in one of the later discovered graves to further implicate Corona. He also disclosed that Jose Rea had been successful in getting a settlement for Corona's brother Natividad, who was charged with the attack in Marysville in 1970. Even though Rea had repeatedly altered his narrative, in the end he had named Natividad as the person who had attacked him. According to Cartel, his plan was successful because it sparked Corona-related protests outside the courthouse, where people demanded justice and attacked the prosecutor and police. He was nonetheless punished for violating the limitations of the gag order. Cartel, who refers to him as Charles Band, claims that he was imprisoned for it. How well the corpses could be dated in terms of the interval since death was a crucial question. The pathologist for the defense claimed that various claims made by the police could not be supported regarding the specifics of burial under those circumstances and that climate. There was at the time little consensus on time of death indicators. Therefore, any claims were open to scrutiny.
On September 11, 1972, the trial got underway in the Solano County Courthouse in Fairfield, California, which is more than an hour away from Yuba City. The trial itself lasted three months, and the jury selection process took many weeks. Richard Hawk was confident that he could prove that Juan's half-brother, not Juan, had committed the murder. It would not be a capital case because the California Supreme Court commuted all death row convictions to life in that state after overturning the death penalty there. It was Tej's first time handling a first-degree murder prosecution, and Kidder claims that despite following the case from beginning to end, Tej neglected to get the blood found on the two knives in Corona's office checked for the blood types of any of the victims. He ultimately had to rush to receive the test results in time because it was an important oversight. The judge was upset by this. Additionally, Tedger requested hair samples from the defendant for testing and hired fresh handwriting specialists to match the ledgers with Corona's handwriting. The victim's blood type did not match Corona's, but a cigarette butt found in the grave with the meat receipts tested positive for a blood type that did. Despite the circumstantial logic, Tedger's case was not supported by any physical evidence, at least not prior to the trial. A two-day opening statement was made by Ada Bart Williams who would later disclose in court that he had some reservations about the case. Teja became irate, an electronic map with 25 lights that could be activated at strategic times as the accused recreated the opening of each grave was offered as a spectacular exhibit by the prosecution, who planned to bring a large list of witnesses to support their theory. But the prosecution withheld so many reports from the defense that the judge eventually ordered the courtroom delivery of its files and the full disclosure of Hawk. He brought with him hundreds of pages of reports to read. The tire track that had been compared to the tires on Corona's cars later proved out not to be the one created at the initial grave. The evidence from a different case had been mixed up. The right cast was eventually discovered and sent for analysis. It was claimed in a report from the FBI lab in Washington that there was a high likelihood that Corona's van's tires were the ones that left the impressions at the graveyard. Although it was later characterized more cautiously as a possible match, Corona's vehicle could not be ruled out. He claimed in court that this report gave the Ada confidence. Hawk, however, told any reporter who would listen that the police might have faked the evidence because they still had Corona's van under their control. For the seventh or eighth time since the case began, he asked for bail on behalf of his client, but was once more denied. Nevertheless, Judge Richard Patton chastised the prosecution for failing to provide him with a compelling argument for denying bail, as was their duty. As the prosecution begged for additional time to complete forensic testing that should have been done months earlier, the trial would continue to display prosecutorial incompetence in the early going. The jury did not think well of it, and one juror who was later excused due to sickness told Hawk as much. That probably gave Hawk a false sense of the direction the investigation was taking. The goal of the defense was to make the jury consider the possibility that Corona had been set up by having receipts placed in an unopened grave. However, the victim's death had occurred far earlier than the four days indicated by the receipts, therefore the police had to rearrange certain data. Hawk claimed that they switched body IDs during their analysis in an effort to tie one of the more recent victims to the receipt in order to establish murder in that particular case. Morticians acknowledged mistakes and confusion when they picked up the dead. But police witnesses stated that the body they had dug up had been so fresh that there had been no decomposition stench. Because they used a different numbering system for the dead than the police did, some of the bodies ended up with multiple numbers. The prosecution asserted that this was really the root of the confusion. There had been no deliberate manipulation of the evidence. But nobody really understood the outcome of the testimony on this matter in the end. Hawk claimed that the prosecution could use the body numbering system to their advantage to support any theory they chose. They may have, but neither side was able to back up their claim. According to Cartel, a bag of fingertips that were taken from the victims in order to better manage the biological evidence turned out to have been labeled incorrectly in multiple instances. The judge was irate once more. A candle and pieces of a candle holder that resembled one from Corona's Sullivan Ranch office were also presented as evidence, and the prosecution claimed that they had been a part of a superstitious religious ceremony. Hawk argued that it might have been planted once more. After all, why would only one burial, and the last one to be opened, hold so much evidence? He attacked repeatedly, pointing out the mistakes that the majority of the officials in question kept making. There was no question that the investigation and handling of the bodies had been done improperly and that the information contained in the reports was both erroneous and insufficient. It was somewhat acceptable considering the circumstances surrounding the protracted and unpleasant dig. Additionally, because no one in that county or across the nation, for that matter, had ever dealt with a case similar to it, evidence handling was very amateurish, with deputies placing their own fingerprints on objects that had not yet been dusted although they never were, to confirm that someone other than Corona had handled items like his pistol and the list of names. 
No fingerprints were collected from any other piece of evidence. It was a case with numerous gaps. Corona himself remained silent and stoic throughout the proceedings, showing his lawyer respect and receiving unwavering backing from his irate and sad family. His four children always attended the events, and one sister had traveled from Mexico to be present. He occasionally turned to face them. No one had ever been tried on all 25 murder charges in a U.S. court before. The strategy was to overwhelm the jury with the sheer brutality of a man who could kill and bury so many men in such a short period of time, despite the fact that even the judge questioned why the people had chosen to include them all. This decision significantly prolonged the trial and put a strain on the county's resources. Corona's homosexuality, however, had not been established, and the initial theory supporting the case had been that the crimes had been motivated by some sort of homosexual liaison. Hawk emphasized this by saying that the victim's exposure suggested they had played the male role, meaning the murderer had been the receptive one, the masochist. Additionally, Mexican masochists frequently felt ashamed of their hidden desires. Such a person would thus experience murderous wrath following a sexual encounter and be capable of killing his partner. Hawk asserted that he had an expert to support this, but in the end, he failed to enter the witness stand. He got his facts from a book, according to Kidder. Hawk's effort to include Natavidad in the conversation was evidenced by this information. It was only a minor step to accuse him of being the disgraced partner who might commit recurrent murders since his sexual orientation was already known. However, due to their ineptitude, the police never even looked into the possibility of another culprit, much less one with the same potential. Without specific proof, Hawk was not permitted to mention Natavidad during his opening statement but the implication persisted thanks to Hawk's infrequent hints. According to Frasier, Hawk made it plain that the main suspect had killed the men in a fit of rage after contracting syphilis during some sort of casual sex episode. Reporters and jury members alike were disinterested and perplexed as the case progressed. The odds were stacked against Teja and his team since it looked like they had built a stick house in a cyclone. However, there were still some unexpected developments, particularly from the defense. One witness, Byron Shannon, provided crucial evidence for the prosecution since he claimed to have seen Corona pick up a number of the victims in his truck. However, his reliability was questioned, and in the end, he appeared to be unsure of what he had actually seen due to his confusion. He was followed by other forensic professionals. Even though no blood had been detected on the machete and it did not match the wounds of the first person recovered, it was an important piece of evidence. The prosecution's expert explained the types of cuts that such a weapon could produce on a surface and asserted that it was impossible to rule out the possibility that other victims who had been too badly damaged for wound examination had also been harmed. In a sense, he left it up for the defense to show differently, which wasn't Hawk's responsibility, thus Hawk reversed the roles. He later informed reporters that he simply needed to demonstrate a reasonable doubt. Although the bullet from William Camp, the only casualty of the shooting, could not be linked to Corona's weapon, a ballistics expert claimed that it was the correct caliber and type for being fired from Corona's pistol. The blood detected on its barrel, however, did not have Camp's blood type. Teja only mentioned the possibility that it might have been used to beat one of the other victims. Hawk emphasized that no blood study could support that. The chest wounds on several of the victims could have been caused by the knives discovered in Corona's office, but a pathologist could not state with certainty that they had. Hawk slammed this house in the jury's face. Blood was discovered on Corona's clothing and in his automobiles, but there wasn't much of it. Hawk claimed that if Corona had been the murderer, there should have been considerably more blood than what one might discover in an average person's home from regular incidents. Bloodstains offered little proof, particularly considering that none had been positively connected to any of the deaths. Even if a witness were to be produced who would claim he had been hurt and transported in the van and none were, despite Hawk's promises, it would not rule out the possibility that the van had transported murder victims, according to another blood expert, Dr. Ruth Guy, who stated that bloodstains from Corona's van had indicated at least three types. The blood types discovered on the knives and in Corona's car are comparable. There were issues with this testimony, though, because the initial saliva test from Corona had been incorrect. She modified her analysis from saying that the saliva test on the cigarette found in one grave did not match the victim or Corona to saying that it did match Corona. That admission provided Hawk some justification for an attack, especially after a criminalist for the prosecution criticized Dr. Guy's method. Teja had also discovered some handwriting specialists who had testified that samples of Corona's writing matched some of the identities contained in the ledger in terms of the letters used. However, his analysis did not seem to be conclusive. Ronald Fahey, a third prosecutor, took on the case in November, 
He used his extensive trial experience to pursue Hawk, with both lawyers looking for any justification to discredit the other. Although it largely leveled the playing field, the court frequently had to mediate their small quarrels. According to the authors who were keeping track, the case became complex and unmanageable, but neither side appeared to have a clear advantage. As a result, these lawyers were forced to engage in personal assaults and self-promotion among the media. The prosecution gave up after 113 witnesses and months of testimony. The court was then startled as Hawk stood up. He requested a directed verdict initially, which would have effectively dismissed the case. Given that the accusations were unsupported by any proof, he wished for an acquittal. He informed the judge that he had also rested his case after not receiving what he had asked for. Despite promising to identify the real culprit in his opening statement, he had no witnesses to call. He seemed to think that the prosecution had screwed up so badly that nothing else needed to be done but to let the jury find them guilty. Because the press had frequently been on his side and because one dismissed witness had told him that the majority of the others were not satisfied with the evidence, Kidder claims that he felt overconfident about reasonable doubt. Whatever the case, it was a brave action. According to Kidder, it seems to some extent that Hawk adjusted his strategy to his objectives rather than the conditions looking back at Hawk's opening speech. In closing arguments, both sides summarized their cases. Cartel claims Hawks took barely seven minutes, whereas Kidder claims it lasted two days and included many detours into legal issues. Richard Hawk essentially gave a different suspect but did not address the issue that no one had been able to identify Natavita as being in the area at the time of the murders. According to Frasier and Kidder, who traveled to Guadalajara to visit Natavita, he had been in Mexico. Although he was unable to provide evidence for it, he was confident that Natavidad had been far from Yuba City at the time of the murders. After the lawsuit against him was resolved, he had left the country, selling everything to pay for a one-way ticket back home. He has been ill ever since. Kidder adds that, despite being entertaining, Hawk's closing argument was not the strongest one he had personally heard Hawk make. The case was then submitted to the jury following Fahey's final rebuttal. According to Cartel, their initial vote was 7-5 to five in favor of acquittal, proving that Hawk had made the right judgment. In actuality, the jury did alert the judge to their impasse at one point, but negotiation has a life of its own. Over the course of the following 46 hours of discussion, they would cast 16 more votes, and in January 1973, the jury found Corona guilty on all 25 counts of first-degree murder, more than any other person in American history at that time. Corona received 25 life sentences with the chance of parole. In due course, 27 killings in Texas would be linked to Dean Corll, but since he was killed by one of his accomplices, he never stood trial. The jury members who later discussed it agreed that it was a mistake for Hawk to rest his case without calling any witnesses. Still, it wasn't over yet. Corona was awaiting the outcome of the appeal in this case. Corona was attacked by four other prisoners at the conclusion of his first year at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville. He was cut and stabbed 32 times, which is so many that he almost lost his life. He allegedly confessed the murders to a clergyman after that. This incident almost cost him an eye, but he later recovered. Although the priest was not permitted to disclose the confession, some accounts of the case managed to include it. There were also two further confessions. According to David Frazier, Corona was visited in prison in 1978 by Mexican consular official Jesus Rodriguez Navarro. That same year, according, he also agreed to a plea deal by confessing to the murders in a letter to Judge Patton, but he also recanted the contents of this letter. Later, he quoted the convicted man as saying, Yes, I did it, but I am a sick man and a sick man cannot be judged by the same standards as other men. A California appeals court examined the trial records from Corona five years after the conclusion of the initial trial and concluded that Richard Hawk had not adequately represented his client. Instead of considering other options, such as a defense of mental incapacity, he had fought the police and he was aware of Corona's prior illness. Even though he had made hints that he would, he had not called any witnesses for the defense, not even Corona himself. Frasier claims that after the trial for tax evasion, Hawk was even disbarred. Additionally, Ed Cray's role as the ghostwriter who sat next to Hawk during the trial to research it and write a book about it was closely examined. The court ruled that there was a conflict of interest because the plan to pay Hawk out of book fees was based on an exclusive agreement. Corona returned to court in February 1982 for a fresh trial. It was held in Hayward, California, and it lasted almost two times as long as the previous trial. The case was once more prosecuted by Richard Fay, but Corona's defense was handled by a superior group. Despite the loss of several important witnesses, the trial continued. 175 witnesses testified, and 1,300 exhibits were accepted over the course of seven months. According to Frazier, taxpayers in California paid little under $5 million in costs. 
But once more, none of the defenses for mental incapacity that the appeals court had anticipated were raised. Natavidan, Juan's half-brother, was once more presented to the jury as a potential suspect, and the police investigation received harsh criticism. Corona stood up to speak for himself during his testimony. He denied any involvement in the crimes while speaking through an interpreter. This time, the jury deliberated for 54 hours over a period of two weeks before finding the defendant guilty. The foreman later told the press that the so-called death ledger, for which the labor contractor had no reasonable explanation, had been the most incriminating piece of evidence against Corona, according to Frasier. Corona's sentence of 25 concurrent life terms was reinstated, with parole hearings occurring every four years. On the grounds of jury misbehavior, the defense attorney asked for a third trial, but this was declined. Corona was unquestionably the most likely suspect, according to one author, Bill Tailbitzer, who had entire access to the police and court data. Some individuals think he was railroaded, while others think he's responsible for more deaths than were revealed in this case. Despite the poorly conducted investigation, two juries found Juan Corona alone to be the murderer of those 25 men. As a result, he continues to be counted among the American monsters. Corona died on March 4, 2019, at the age of 85.